Gold has held a rare attraction since antiquity. This is partly a matter of aesthetics, because its fabulous colour does not tarnish, and its malleability creates opportunities for the jeweller, both as a nugget or beaten into sheets of gold leaf. The use of gold for coinage, for upmarket dishes, and for adornment has risen and fallen as supply and taste have fluctuated. At the time that Australia was first occupied by Europeans, the bulk of world's gold was produced in South America, and this continued until the 1840s, when Russia, and especially California, came to prominence. The dramatic Californian gold rush at the end of the 1840s attracted thousands of Australians across the Pacific in a spirit of optimistic greed. All manner of folk sought a fortune in California, including some Aboriginal men from Pitwater. So by 1851, gold was a matter of keen interest to many people in New South Wales. The 1840s and 1850s were critical years of change in New South Wales. The transportation of new European convicts to the colony had ended in 1840. The age of squatters moved into the age of widely accessible pastoral properties, while rural and urban industry proliferated in the wake of the new power of steam. New institutions of governance were established, and Victoria and Queensland separated from New South Wales. The gold rushes, which began in 1851, were a dramatic catalyst right in the centre of these two decades of change. The presence of some gold in Australia had been known since at least the 1820s, and the Reverend W. B. Clark had found alluvial gold in the Bathurst area in the early 1840s. But Governors Gipp and initially Fitzroy had seen gold as potentially disruptive, especially to the pastoral industry. The impact of the Californian experience of 1848 to 1850 was fully felt in Australia, only when payable gold was found across the mountains. The New South Wales gold rush of 1851 and 1852 briefly brought unexampled traffic onto the Western Road, the road to Bathurst and its hinterland. Hopeful gold seekers from all walks of life carried swags, pushed wheelbarrows, or drove horses and carts, and the proprietors of coach services responded to the new potential market. This contemporary sketch had a, gives a glimpse of the congestion on the road leading into Bathurst in 1851. This talk is part of the current project of the Royal Australian Historical Society entitled Beyond the Blue Mountains, Following the Road from Bathurst. And that is precisely what all the earliest gold seekers in New South Wales did. They followed the road from Bathurst. For the roads to the successive diggings radiated out from Bathurst. From Bathurst, the roads to the diggings were in 1851 still more tracks than roads. These tracks first went northwest to Lewis Ponds Creek in February 1851, and then in May continued northwards to Ophir. On the map, the road to Lewis Ponds and Ophir is shown in red on the lower left. Ophir was romantically named after King Solomon's fabled resource. The biblical book of Job had said that wisdom cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir. The Australian Ophir lay on a fairly dramatic part of Summerhill Creek. This is an engraving of a sketch made on the spot by Colonel Mundy in 1851 and was soon published in England. Many miners, drunk with excitement, as a contemporary observer noted, lived roughly in improvised dwellings like this group at Ophir around this time. People came and people went. The population was volatile. Late in May 1851, a correspondent reported that the arrivals are still very numerous, notwithstanding the numbers who are returning. On Thursday, he said, no fewer than 800 people were counted on the road from Bathurst to Ophir. By June 1851, the epicentre had moved to another road, another waterway, the Turon River. Some of the 2,000-odd people who had tried their luck at Ophir, and many newcomers, travelled to Safala, which was on the right centre of this map at all. As the map suggests, this was rugged country. Colonel Mundy travelled this road from Bathurst to Safala in 1851. As we approached the pass, a cart was climbing it, like a fly up a wall. The wain was empty, the men shouldering the packages, staggering slowly but surely onwards. With gold ahead, men do not stick at trifles. 
This is Monday's sketch of the miner's camp under the towering wallaby rocks just beyond Cephala. Cephala is an alternative linguistic form of the ancient Ophir, so the same expectations applied to on the Turon as on Summerhill Creek. The Turon miners, like alluvial miners everywhere, were looking for specks or nuggets of gold washed down by the river and creek system into the alluvial soil and the beds of the streams. The Presbyterian minister, John Dunbar Lang, also visited Cephala in 1851, and he described the process of alluvial mining with his usual vigour. There are holes to be dug on a river bank of all dimensions, from that of an infant's grave to that of a saw pit or a full-sized quarry. You can still see such holes today along the Turon River near Cephala. This picture is particularly illuminating because it shows the depth of alluvial deposit adjacent to the river. Dunbar Lang goes on to describe how the miners picked out all the large stones they found in the holes they dug into the alluvial soil, scraped them with a knife for any specks of gold, and then transported the remaining smaller stuff to the bank of the river, where it is, he said, deposited in a heap for the operations of the cradler. This is a particularly clear view right in front of the picture uh, of how the miners used the cradle to rock the alluvial gravels and pebbles while pouring water through so that the heavier gold would sink. As things became more sophisticated, a chute might be used for conveying the spoil from a digging place to the cradle. Or simple techniques like pans and cradles were, however, still being used many decades later. This example is from Box Ridge in 1893, and hopeful fossickers can still in 2015 go to eBay and buy a gold, gold pan for $9 or a deluxe gold panning kit for $95, complete with a plastic nugget bottle and suction tweezers to pick up tiny specks of gold. The gold seekers 160 years ago needed the equivalent, so it was not available in plastic. As a result, the gold rushes created a bonanza for blacksmiths both in Sydney and over the mountains. Not just blacksmiths, but also carpenters, bootmakers, cobblers, butchers, storekeepers and innkeepers developed their businesses in existing towns like Bathurst and Mudgee, in the new mining nodes and on pastoral properties like such as Brucedale. The old grazing property of Brucedale lay on the road from Bathurst to Safara, and thousands of gold seekers passed close by. Charlotte Sutter of Brucedale complained in her diary on the 26th of July 1851 that I have been putting the house in order again for so many people coming. It is always like an hotel. An Aboriginal shipper, Dr. Kerr, the brother-in-law of William Sutter, found a lump of pure gold weighing 46 kilos on his grazing property at Louisa Creek at, at Hargraves, near the top of this map of the gold sites. Kerr brought it south to Bathurst for sale, but stopped off at Bruce Dale for a fortnight and concealed his treasure in his Sutter dining room cupboard. Kerr was a spontaneous beneficiary of the quest for gold, but his relationship with Bruce Dale reminds us that there was an intertwining of the grazier's interests and the more short-term interests of those who sought gold. Those anxious for short-term gain created a quite large and volatile population over the mountains. The government viewed the situation with apprehension, but in general the behaviour of the newcomers was reasonably good. Women were heavily outnumbered on the gold field, but there were many wives who made the rough living less rough in places like Ophir, and toughness was not the same as incivility. Religion played a greater role than one might have expected. In this view of Ophir in 1851, the small building on the left, on the left distance behind the dwellings, is a church built for the miners. I find it striking that most of the miners on Summerhill Creek and on the Turon did not work on Sundays. This is Monday's transcript of a day book of a group of eight miners at Wallaby Rocks near Cephala in 1851. The miners supplied the record to the editor of the Bathurst Free Press, and it was published by Colonel Monday in our antipodes. The men won 16 ounces of gold on a Saturday, and more than 20 ounces on the following Monday, but we rested on the Sabbath. And more than rested, they might also go to church. On one Sunday in October 1851, no fewer than three well-attended church services were held simultaneously around Safara. 
leading churchmen had come from Sydney. Archbishop Paulding in person said a Catholic Mass. Dr. Dunmore Lang preached a Presbyterian sermon to over a thousand minors on the other side of the Turan, while an Anglican service was held nearby at Golden Point. But this population was constantly on the move. Some people moved from Goldfield to Goldfield, restlessly responding to optimistic rumours, while some simply went home. It all created some widespread dislocation and shifting pressure points, not least when they landed properties in the central west. Like other graziers, the Sutters had a labour problem. In 1849, the Sutters had employed 140 people to, on the estate centred on Brucedale. Two years later, in 1851, more than 80 of these left for the goldfields. Many returned after a while, but others did not. Such dislocations affected the local towns like Bathurst. Oh, numerous townsfolk left Bathurst clutching a gold pan. There were also opportunities for expansions of services to cater for the increased rural population. The result was net gain, and the urban population over the mountains rose sharply after 1851. The town of Bathurst itself almost doubled in population over the 1850s, while Orange, which had only 28 inhabitants in 1851, had become a proper town of 581 souls ten years later. Moreover, unlike the goldfield townships, both Bathurst and Orange had almost as many females as males in their population in the 1850s and beyond. By contrast, at Sofala, in 1861, less than a quarter of the population was female while up west at Hill End and Tamburura, marked on this map, women counted for less than 20%. The demographic of the whole state was affected after 1851, not simply the central west. This graph, which was prepared by Eric Dunlop for the Royal Australian Historical Society 65 years ago, shows how the population of New South Wales increased steadily from 190,000 in 1851 to 350,000 by 1861. Victoria, which split off from New South Wales in 1851, surged ahead of its parent, largely due to its even more dramatic gold rushes of the 1850s. Victoria reached a population of 580,000 by 1861, 230,000 more than New South Wales. But there was some adjustment in the 1860s when alluvial gold again became attractive in New South Wales and the thousands of ordinary miners transferred from Victoria. The value of the gold extracted on these alluvial fields in the two states, New South Wales and Victoria, compared to California in the 1850s, sort of, shows how New South Wales was overshadowed internationally by both California and Victoria. This is another graph by Dunlop. The figures on the left are the value of gold extracted in millions of pounds sterling. California soared up to exceed 10 million pounds by 1853, but in its first year, 1852, Victoria had exceeded California and stayed above California for the next four years before slowly declining. New South Wales has a more modest place at the foot of Eric Dunlop's graph. One million or at most two million dollars was of course a lot of money, equivalent to more than a hundred times as many modern Australian dollars, but the discrepancy between the two states is real. This is why Bathurst became a substantial country town, while Ballarat, in the heart of the Victorian goldfields, became a glittering city of international renown. The goldfields of New South Wales attracted a wide diversity of people from many parts of the globe. But many of the gold seekers of the 1850s in the Central West came from homes in the Sydney area. Others were attracted from other states. As early as June 1851, 200 Victorians came by ship to Sydney to join the exodus to Ophir. Some men thronged from overseas. Some were returning from the Californian gold rush. Some were Americans, emboldened by California. And just as Aboriginal people from Australia had gone to the west coast of America, so now a few black Americans came to the central west of Australia. But most of the newcomers were from England and Ireland, with a smaller number from Scotland. Continental Europeans came also, particularly from Germany. The majority of the new immigrants went to Victoria, but tens of thousands came to New South Wales. The new arrivals in the goldfields which have attracted most discussion were, however, the Chinese. 
by 1861, some 13,000 people, almost all men living in New South Wales, had been born in China. Chinese shepherds had been a familiar enough sight in the Central West in the 1840s, before the gold rush. For example, a prominent grazier, Andrew Brown of Coolwell, had employed Chinese to bring his flocks from the Castlery River there to his headquarters near modern Lithgow for shearing. This is the stone shearing shed, still surviving as a ruin beside Coolwell House. But the number of Chinese was small before 1852. The Chinese gold seekers were characteristically men working to send money home to their families left behind in China. Their disciplined labour and water management on the alluvial fields, often picking over areas which Europeans had worked but abandoned when the yield diminished, were in many ways admirable. But they led to rancour among European miners and ultimately to restrictive legislation. The industry of the Chinese had left behind many kilometres of water races and many traces of their work retrieving every speck of alluvial gold, like this area on the Turon, still known today as Chinaman's Reach, or the small China town called the Isle of Dreams on Erskine Flat, a kilometre outside Safar. Later in the century, these Chinese men who had not returned to China often became market gardeners and supplied fresh vegetables both in the cities and in towns like Bathurst. The lust for gold continued long after the 1850s, but its expression changed. The geologists had long known that the gold in the Turin Macquarie system had leached from underground reefs. As easily accessible alluvial gold became harder and harder to find, attention turned to sinking shafts and digging tunnels to find the parent reefs. Even simple shafts of simple head frames like this one at Wattle Flat called for substantial capital investment, quite unlike the modest expenditure needed for penning and cradling. Although the first attempts at reef mining had been made at Hargraves as early as 1852 and at Hill End's Golden Gully in 1858, the main thrust of reef mining was most evident only after the 1860s. And it was impressive at every level. Great steam boilers, powering crushing equipment, the process of gold bearing ore brought up by the underground miners were expensive to buy and expensive to move into the difficult places where so many gold mines were located. This impressive suite of machinery is still on site at Wattle Flat, south of Safala. Other processing plants might call for the construction of great chimneys in the bush. This one survives at Chambers Creek, a really remote tributary of the Macquarie River, northwest of Bathurst. While to gain access to the mines, the elaborate flying foxes were erected. This one for the consolidated mines still exists at Hewen. Although many such relics have disappeared over 140 years, there is a magnificent collection of reef mining sites and equipment still to be seen in the Central West, if you know where to look off the beaten track. But the environmental evidence of the early alluvial phase is also striking in its own way. This is an old photograph of some of the erosion at Hill End, while this is my own photograph of the effect of mining on Ichuran and Safala. And if you were able to go on a light aircraft over Hill End, the outstanding impression is of hectares and hectares of eroded soil, where even today nothing grows. So the gold rushes of the 19th century are still today an intrinsic part of the Central West heritage, just as you were an important element in shaping the way the area developed after 1850. This is Pine Ridge on the edge of Copperhenia Creek in 1872. There is still a crushing battery there today, and Copperhenia Creek is still wildly beautiful and hard of access. Countless scenes in the Central West, like Pine Ridge, played their role in the great themes of the mid-19th century. The end of transportation and the new reliance on free labour, the gradual introduction of responsible government, the severance from New South Wales, first to Victoria, then of Queensland, the significance of immigration from overseas, not only from the Anglo-Celtic world, but also from Asia, the creation of the first of many mining booms and their inevitable busts and the acceleration in opening up the western plains for pasture, for cropping and for minerals. That is what Beyond the Blue Mountains is all about.